I'm Margaret Brennan reporting from Beijing. And this week on Face the Nation, Secretary of State Antony Blinken is here with an intense diplomatic push to try to improve relations between the U.S. and China. I'm Robert Costa in Washington, back here at home this weekend. The 2024 presidential campaign picked back up after a tumultuous week for former president and Republican frontrunner Donald Trump. We'll have the latest on the investigations and legal challenges facing Trump. And we'll speak to his former attorney general, William Barr, plus one of the newest GOP contenders, one-time Trump confidant, turned bitter rival, former New Jersey governor, Chris Christie. We'll talk with Connecticut Democratic Senator Richard Blumenthal about the investigations into the planned merger between the PGA Tour and the Saudi-owned golf league, Live. It's all ahead on Face the Nation. Good morning and welcome to Face the Nation. We've got a lot to get to, but we want to begin with Secretary of State Antony Blinken's trip to China, the first U.S. diplomatic mission there in five years. Margaret is in Beijing. Margaret, it looks like good evening to you. It is, Bob, and good morning to you here in Beijing. More than five and a half hours worth of talks between Secretary Blinken and his Chinese counterpart concluded. They were very direct. They were very candid. But frankly, it's good that they were talking at all. Bob, one of the U.S. officials in the room told me there was at least one point of agreement, and that was to stop the downward spiral in this relationship. But it is clear they still have profound differences. Secretary Blinken and Foreign Minister Qin Gong, a close ally of President Xi Jinping, tackled a long list of grievances. The U.S. goal? Open communication channels to avoid a military clash. Tension spiked last summer when then House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan. And again in February after the spy balloon shootdown. Now President Biden wants to move on. But I don't think the leadership knew where it was, knew the minute, knew it was more embarrassing than it was. Beijing objects to the U.S. military presence in the Pacific. China's defense chief refuses to speak with U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin at a time when Beijing is massively expanding its nuclear arsenal. The door is open. And uh, my phone is, uh, my phone line is open. Miscommunication risks a clash. Last month, a Chinese warship came within 150 feet of slamming into an American ship transiting the Taiwan Strait. And in the South China Sea, a Chinese fighter jet buzzed the U.S. Air Force. The divide runs deeper than a failure to communicate. Blinken also pressed authorities to crack down on the flow of fentanyl. That drug is now the number one killer of Americans under the age of 50. Beijing has its own motivations to meet. It wants investments to continue to flow as its economy is slowing. The recent Biden administration decision to cut off the sale of some advanced technology and high-end computer chips is causing concern. Secretary Blinken will have a working dinner with his Chinese counterpart tonight and tomorrow. He plans to meet with a top party official who oversees foreign policy. All of these meetings really an intense push to try to hit restart on this relationship. Bob. Margaret, speaking of a restart, what do both sides hope to achieve from these meetings and will there be deliverables? Expectations have been set very low for actual uh, achievements in terms of deliverables, as they call them in Washington. But we know that here in Beijing, the ultimate hope may be for a face-to-face -face meeting between President Xi and President Biden this fall, perhaps as soon as September, or at a key conference in California this coming November. So all of this may be building up uh, to that meeting between the two leaders of the world's most powerful economies. Uh, in the meantime, it is that economic interest that is also of chief concern here. The U.S. and Chinese economies are so intertwined. There is interest in lowering tension to alleviate some of that nervousness uh, in the business community. And we also know uh, that when it comes to concern about technology and investment, uh, the U.S. wants to continue that flow 
uh, between both countries uh, and wants to tamp down some of the concern going into this next year. But fundamentally here, President Biden believes that this country of China is the only one in the world that has both the power and the intent to change the global order. This is about competition. Margaret, will Secretary Blinken meet with Xi Jinping? Bob, that meeting may depend on these next 24 hours and how they go. But arrangements are being made uh, for President Xi to meet with Antony Blinken, the Secretary of State, who has been a key aide to President Biden over his many years in the Senate uh, and uh, in the White House. So this is an important face to face to lay the groundwork for that possible presidential summit. Margaret, thank you. Margaret will be back later in the broadcast. We're joined now by William Barr. He served as attorney general under former President Trump. His book, One Damn Thing After Another, is now available in paperback. Good morning, Mr. Barr. Thank you for being here. Thanks for inviting me, Bob. Former President Trump now says everyone except you says this indictment is about election interference and should not have been brought. He said, you know, the indictment is total BS. That's his. That's our shorthand for what he actually said. He's also known for watching the Sunday shows, and he obviously saw your appearance on another network last Sunday. Why is he wrong about this? Well, he, you know, this is, this is not a circumstance where he's the victim or th this is government overreach. Uh, he provoked this whole problem himself. Yes, he's been the victim of unfair witch hunts in the past, but that doesn't obviate the fact that he's also a fundamentally flawed person who engages in reckless conduct and that leads to situations, calamitous situations like this, uh, which are very destructive and hurt any political cause he's associated with. And this was a case that entirely of his own making. He had no right to those documents. Uh, the uh, government tried for over a year quietly and with respect to get them back, which was essential that they do. And he jerked them around. And he had no legal basis for keeping them. But beyond that, when, when he faced his subpoena, he didn't raise any legal arguments. He engaged in a course of deceitful conduct, according to the, uh, the indictment, that was a clear crime if those allegations are true and were out, was outrageous. He, what he did was, uh, he, according to the indictment, is he took the documents out of storage, led his lawyer to believe that he'd be conducting a full search of the boxes, and uh, then caused his lawyer to file with the court something saying that he had completed a search. How strong is the special counsel's case on obstruction specifically? Well, it's very strong because a lot of the evidence comes from his own lawyers. And furthermore, there's evidence of him saying things that are completely incompatible with any idea that this was an innocent document dispute. Do you believe he lied to the Justice Department? Do I personally believe it? Yes, I do. And do you believe that, that he, he continues to claim that he has all these privileges and rights under the Presidential Records Act? Is he mischaracterizing the act? It, 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 absolutely. Uh, the legal theory by which he gets to take battle plans and, and sensitive national security information as his personal papers is absurd. It's just as wacky as the legal doctrine they came up with for, you know, having the vice president unilaterally determine who won the election. The whole purpose of the statute, the Presidential Records Act, is, was to stop presidents from taking official documents out of the White House. It was passed after Watergate. That's the whole purpose of it. And therefore, it restricted what a president can take. It says it's purely private. That had nothing to do with uh, the uh, deliberations of government policy. Obviously, these documents are not purely private. It's, it's obvious. And, they're not even now arguing that it's purely private. What they're saying is the president just has sweeping discretion to say they are, even though they squarely don't fall within the definition. It's an absurd argument. Do you believe if he is convicted, he should serve his prison sentence? Well, I don't, we haven't even gotten to the point of, you know, whether he's been convicted and also what if his happens? sentence should be. I, I, you know, I don't like the idea of a former president serving time in prison. Republicans remain critical of the attorney general who spoke out this week, as well as Director Ray at the FBI. They've rallied to Trump's side. Are they wrong to say that this Justice Department is acting in a political way? 
Well, if they're p pointing to this case, I think they're wrong. I think the department had no choice but to seek those documents. Their basic argument really isn't to defend his conduct because Trump's conduct is indefensible. What they're really saying is he should get a pass because Hillary Clinton got a pass six or seven years ago. Now, I think, you know, that's not a frivolous argument, but I... I'm not sure that's true. I think if you want to restore the rule of law and equal justice, you don't do it by further derogating from justice. You do it by applying the right standard here. And that's not unfair to Trump because this is not a case where Trump is innocent and being unfairly hounded. He committed the crime. Or if he did commit the crime, it's not unfair to hold him to that standard. You say Trump's alleged conduct is indefensible. So many Republicans continue to defend him. What will it say if the party your longtime party puts him forward as their nominee. Well, that's the problem. I don't think they're actually defending his conduct, but they are saying it's unfair to prosecute him. But that then raises another question. Okay, if it's unfair to prosecute him, that's not the whole answer. The question is, should we be putting someone like this forward as the leader of the country, leader of the free world, who's engaged in this kind of conduct? The other thing is, this is not just an isolated example. Trump has, you know, has many good qualities and he accomplished some good things. But the fact of the matter is, uh, he is a consummate narcissist, and he constantly engages in reckless conduct that, that puts uh, his political followers at risk and, and, and the conservative and Republican agenda at risk. Would he put the country at risk if he was in the White House again? He, he will always put his own interests and gratifying his own ego ahead of everything else, including the country's interests. There's no question about it. This is a perfect example of that. He's like, you know, he's like a nine-year-old, a defiant nine-year-old kid who's always pushing the glass toward the edge of the table, defying his parents to stop him from doing it. It's a means of self-assertion and exerting his dominance over other their people. And he's, he's a very petty individual who will always put his interests ahead of the country's, his personal gratification of his, you know, of his ego. But our this country, our country can't, you know, can't be a therapy session for, you know, a troubled man like this. This is not the only special counsel investigation, an ongoing one on January 6th. So many witnesses being called in. You were the star witness for the House January 6th committee. Are you willing to testify or have you already testified before the special counsel? Well, if they, you know, if they call me in as a witness, of course I would, would testify. But all I said was what I said, you know, what I recounted in my book about this full story about a stolen election. Have you talked to them in any way behind the scenes, if well, not I, formal testimony? Well, I'm not going to get into any communications I had with the government. But I don't expect to be a witness, but I'll be glad to be one if I'm called. Trump was just indicted and arraigned in the records case. Do you believe he's a target potentially in the January 6th case? Yes, and I've said from the beginning. By the way, I've defended him when I think there's cases that are unfair, like the one up in New York and so forth. Uh, and I've always said I think the January 6th case will be a hard case to make because of First Amendment interest. But I'm actually starting to think they will pull the trigger on that, and I would expect it to be this summer. Do you believe the Fulton County District Attorney, Fonnie Willis, will indict Trump in Georgia? Uh, yeah, I don't know much about her case. Uh, I don't know if it's, uh, you know, a sound case or not. I'm skeptical about that. But I, if Why I are you would, skeptical? Again, because of the First Amendment interest. You know, we don't want to get into a position where people can't complain about an election and claim that an election well, Trump is Trump said stolen. on tape he wants the Secretary of State to find votes. Yeah, I know. Uh, but, you know, there's, there are innocent interpretations of what he said, you know, which is, look, of all the votes that we think are bad, you certainly can find among them some that are slam dunk. But whether that's the proper interpretation or not, I, I am more skeptical of that case. But on the other hand, I think it's likely that it will be brought. Former Attorney General William Barr, we really appreciate you taking the time to stop by. And Face the Nation will be right back. Don't go away. We turn now to the 2024 presidential campaign and former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. He is in Bayhead, New Jersey. Good morning. Governor, have some Republicans, especially those in Congress, been too quick to rally behind Trump this week without knowing the full scope of the evidence in the records case? Look, uh, if you read that indictment, and as you recall, Bob, I did this work for seven years as the United States Attorney in New Jersey, the fifth largest office in the country. And that indictment lays out some very, very disturbing facts about not only the president, the former president, keeping all these documents, the national security documents that he had no right to keep under the Presidential Rack Records Act or any other law, but worse, instructing his lawyers to lie 
and to obstruct the government from getting those documents back. Um, there's some very disturbing conduct in there, including the showing of these documents to other people that were not cleared to be able to see them. So I think that we've got to have a full trial here and a fair one. The president, the former president is presumed innocent until proven guilty. But the conduct in there, Bob, is deeply disturbing. And what I'm concerned about is, look, we need change at the Department of Justice. Um, and, and if I'm president, you can be guaranteed that we'll put an attorney general in there who will lead without fear or favor and clear out anyone who does show partisanship. Um, but that's a different issue than the conduct that Donald Trump engaged in. And in my view, that's not the conduct that we should have from someone who wants to be president of the United States again. Governor, you just said you'd make some changes at the Department of Justice. Some of your rivals in the race have said that the Justice Department, in their view, is weaponizing this investigation, targeting former President Trump. You know the FBI director for years, Chris Wray. Are your rivals wrong when they talk about the DOJ becoming weaponized? Look, I think the DOJ under Eric Holder became weaponized. Uh, and, and the fact of the matter is, when you look at what he did, um, as his time as attorney general, both against Republicans and in refusing, along with Loretta Lynch later but on, what about now, Governor? Um, to prosecute uh, Hillary Clinton. Well, I'll get to it, Bob. And, and I think now what we're looking at is people seeing things as being inequitable, that if you don't prosecute Hillary Clinton and you choose to prosecute Donald Trump, that that raises real questions in Republicans' minds. And it should. But it does not change the conduct we would not be here if Donald Trump had simply returned the documents the dozens of times the government asked him to return them, the times that the grand jury served a subpoena for them. He waited, waited, and waited, defied the government, and then um, wound up having his, his house raided. And when they did, they found over 100 more classified documents after he had told everybody months earlier he had returned everything. That conduct is indefensible in my view. And if it's true, uh, as alleged in the indictment, he is in severe legal trouble. Indefensible, disturbing, your words about this alleged conduct. Is the Republican Party right now not only at a crossroads politically, but historically? Look, I said this when I announced for president. We have been at a crossroads at numbers of times in, in our nation's history, 1776. 1861, 1941, 1961, and 1981. Um, in all those years, we had presidents like George Washington, like Abraham Lincoln, like FDR, like JFK, and like Ronald Reagan, who had a choice between going small and going big and doing big things for America. We need a president who, once again, is not looking at this small stuff in the rearview mirror, who's constantly whining and complaining and moaning about how things are unfair. What we need as a party and as a country is a president who will go big, lead America to big achievements and big goals again. And there's nobody, Bob, who can do big better than me. How will history see your own role with Trump? Look, I made it very clear in 2016, I did not want Hillary Clinton to be president of the United States, and I think that was the right decision. And my hope back in 2016 was that I could make Donald Trump a better candidate, and if he won, a better president. I tried, and I was wrong. I couldn't make him a better president. And he failed over and over again. This is a race for the White House. You're not the only one running against former President Trump. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is ahead of you in the polls. Does DeSantis have what it takes to become the leading Trump alternative? Well, look, we're going to find out. Um, I don't know Governor DeSantis all that well. I trust I'll get to know him much better over the course of this campaign. But I'll say this, um, Bob, and, and people can see this if, if they go to our website at chrischristie.com. They'll see that in the, the last two polls in New Hampshire, we are now solidly in third place after one week in the race and only four points behind Governor DeSantis, who's in second place. So this is a race to be the Trump alternative. Right now, Tony Blinken, the Secretary of State, meeting with Chinese officials. Do you believe it's the right decision by the Biden administration to engage with China in this way? Look, Bob, I think the problem has been the entire Biden administration 
has been filled with mishaps towards China. First, let's start with Ukraine, where Joe Biden said a small incursion wouldn't be a problem. He sent a signal to Russia and China that a war in Ukraine would be okay. China is now funding it because we gave them the signal it was okay. And Russia is killing innocent Ukrainian citizens who only want their freedom. Um, he has made mistakes in terms of not being tougher against China on the stealing of our intellectual property, letting spy balloons fly over our country unharassed. Whatever he's doing today is uh, a day late and a dollar short, um, Bob. He should have been being much more direct with China right from the beginning. And I think people who know me know that there will be no confusion on the part of President Xi when I'm president of the United States about what American policy is and that every day we'll be fighting to make America the winner in this competition against China. Governor Christie, we'll see you on the campaign trail soon. We appreciate you being here and face the nation. We'll be right back. Don't go away. As we head into the first official days of summer, we're seeing mixed signals when it comes to the economy. Mark Strassman reports. At San Francisco's biggest shopping mall, default is the new black. Westfield Mall's owners have returned the keys to their lender, an unaffordable commercial loan, and a cautionary tale about our economy's next stress test. There's going to be a wave of defaults along the commercial real estate. The tighter banks are going to get with their lending, which means less credit is going to be available to consumers. Beleaguered consumers, millions of them. The cost of living has really increased a lot, um, so it's, it's getting a little harder to do things that, you know, I would typically do. Inflation still high, but dropping. For the first time in 15 months, the Fed last week paused a hike in interest rates. A 30-year fixed mortgage now averages just under 7%, more than a doubling in two years. Car loans, rates also now average roughly 7%, a 15-year high. And credit cards, typical rates on existing cards near 21%, the highest since 1994. Here's the flip side. So many Americans keep spending. Big ticket buys like cars may be encouraged by plunging gas prices. This time last year, gas averaged above $5 a gallon, a record. This weekend, about $360. Investors also buying. The S&P 500 and NASDAQ have hit their highest levels since April of last year. But the stock market is not the economy. Which brings us back to Westfield Mall's drama, what it represents. Banks have about $3 trillion outstanding in commercial real estate loans. More than half that will come up for refinancing this summer. And at today's higher rates, many more borrowers may just walk away. Mark Strassman reporting from Atlanta. We'll be right back. Tomorrow, the nation will be honoring Juneteenth. That's the anniversary of the date in 1865 in which word reached the last enslaved Americans that they had been freed. Two years after, the Emancipation Proclamation was issued. We'll be right back with a lot more Face the Nation. Welcome back to Face the Nation. Before I traveled here to Beijing, I sat down in Washington with CBS News foreign policy and national security contributor H.R. McMaster to discuss some of the challenges with the U.S. and China. The White House has said that there have been an alarming number of increasingly uh, aggressive actions by the People's Liberation Army, that's China's military, in recent months. There was video of a near miss in the South China Sea in the air, and then one at sea uh, in the Taiwan Strait recently as well. How unusual are these kind of incidents? Well, they're not unprecedented, but it's unusual in terms of the quick succession of multiple incidents. I think China's sending a message, hey, we're in charge now, you're finished. To the, to the West and to the United States. And, and I think it's indicative of what they hope to achieve, Margaret, which is to create kind of an exclusionary area of primacy across the Indo-Pacific region. They've laid claim to the ocean in the South China Sea, for example. So I think this really calls for us to have a strong response. I think, you know, with, the, with uh, Secretary Blinken's visit there, it, it may portray a bit of weakness in terms of... What do you mean? 
Well, I think we've been so anxious to, to have this discussion with the Chinese, and the Chinese have been really playing hard to get in terms of the, in terms of the discussion. I think what they hope with the optics of this meeting, and I'm sure Secretary Blinken is quite aware of this, is to create a perception that we're going there to pay homage to the Chinese Communist Party, because they want to use that kind of perception mm -hmm. of China's strength relative to the United States to bludgeon countries in the region and say, hey, time to bandwagon with us. This is our era, what they call the, the new era of international relations. Well, arguably, a lot of the Biden administration policies look a lot like the Trump administration policies, uh, at least directionally here. Relations right. have been going downhill for years now. This is the first visit since 2018. So if the visit itself, you question, um, is a risk, how do you make this successful? Well, I think it's okay to talk, right? Diplomacy is okay. It's just the conditions under which the discussion is, is conducted. And, so what do you mean by that? And how it's portrayed. Location? So I, I think not, not necessarily location, but just the atmosphere around it in connection with uh, China really, I think, wanting to tr try to get some concessions in exchange for just the, the privilege of talking with mm -hmm. them. And this might have to, have to do with uh, some policy decisions about whether or not to restrict or ask allies to restrict chip sales, for example, to Chinese industries. But I think what's really important to note is that China has not come off the path of aggression. You mentioned the People's Liberation Army aggression, but a broad range of economic uh, aggression that China's engaged in. And so I think it's important just to stick to our guns on this. And, and it's important to have diplomacy with China, mm -hmm. but let's have also diplomacy with countries that might be sitting on the fence to say, hey, your choice really at this moment is not between Washington and Beijing. It's between sovereignty and, and servitude. So one of Secretary Blinken's stated goals is to help open up these lines of communication between the militaries. You can't oppose that. You must no, want that. No, I think it's important to have those kind of confidence-building measures, ways to deconflict. But it takes two, two parties to do it. Right. What, what are the obstacles to this is the Chinese Communist Party is so centralized in terms of the power of Xi Jinping mm -hmm. that he's unwilling to decentralize communications to anybody else at many times. When you, when you meet with Chinese Communist Party officials, mm -hmm. Margaret, it's typically they're reading off five by eight cards. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you try to, you know, tell a few jokes, right? <laughs> Make a connect, personal connection. It's really hard to do. So when we recently spoke with Bob Gates, the former CIA director and, and defense secretary, he said, even in the worst days of the Cold War, there was at least a way for the United States and Soviet Union to have communications about these kind of military incidents to avoid escalation. Okay. That framework does not exist today with China. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't one have to be created, or do you think that ambiguity or that risk is, is a choice. We ought to always say, hey, the door's open for that kind of communication. But I, I think it's, it's up to the Chinese Communist Party. It takes two to be willing to have that kind of, that kind of a, that line open. The CCP's become very aggressive, not only against the United States, but a broad range of nations, and not even to mention, you know, short of military aggression, how about cyber attacks? How about campaigns of economic aggression against you know, Australia and Lithuania mm -hmm. and others? So I, I think it's, it's important to look at the behavior of the party because they talk a great game, right? You know, the, a new era of great power relationship, you know, a, a right. community of common destiny for all mankind. Now, that sounds like a great program, right? I mean, I, that's not what I would want to sign up for, though, with, a, with the Chinese Communist Party in charge. So recently it was publicly disclosed that China has set up uh, and in, rebuilt part of its listening facilities that are located in nearby Cuba. Right. Secretary Blinken acknowledged that this week. Yeah. To a lot of people, they hear and see something like that and they think of the old Cold War. Right. How different is this model? It's, it's worse. <laughs> it's worse because it's, it's a more difficult problem set because of the way that our economies have become interconnected in large measure based on these flawed assumptions about the nature of the relationship and especially the intentions of the Chinese Communist Party. That's what we got wrong. Mm -hmm. We thought that, that we could determine the behavior of the party by the way we engage them. But hey, guess what? I mean, the Chinese Communist Party leadership had aspirations that went far beyond anything in reaction to what we do. And China really does want to establish itself yeah. as it sees it at the center. What are the 
key phrases, the key things you were looking for and watching for out of this meeting? I think competition and, and a recognition on our part that the Chinese Communist Party has to change its behavior for there to be a better relationship. There's always an impulse in diplomacy to think that a better relationship is an end in and of itself. Mm -hmm. But actually, if, if the perception is that we're going to make concession after concession just for a better relationship, I mean, the, the outcome could be something that appears like a diplomatic achievement, but it could be a political disaster. We'll be right back. In recent months, the world of professional golf has been divided into two camps, with players forced to choose between being either part of the PGA Tour or an upstart saudi back golf league known as Live. The two leagues recently announced plans to join forces, and there's been considerable backlash among some players and in Congress due to Saudi Arabia's record of human rights abuses and the killing of Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Connecticut Democratic Senator Richard Blumenthal launched a Senate investigation into the merger, and he joins us this morning from Bridgeport. Senator Blumenthal, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Bob. Senator, you've demanded more information from the PGA and Liv about how this agreement came together. Tell us, what exactly do you want? The subcommittee, uh, permanent subcommittee on investigations, which I chair, is essentially trying to uncover the facts about what went into this deal, who was behind it, and whether there was any improper conduct or wrongdoing, and what the structure and governance will be of the entity going forward. There are very, very few details. But remember, what we have here is essentially a repressive, autocratic foreign government taking control over an iconic, cherished American institution for the clear purpose of cleansing its public in, in image. The Saudis have been very explicit that they have a strategic objective here. They've been engaged in numerous malign activities antithetical to American interests and values, killing Jamar Khashoggi, as you mentioned, as well as other journalists, mm -hmm. torturing and imprisoning dissidents and critics, and s supporting anti-democratic uh, activities, even terrorist activities, like 9-11, as well as the internal war in Yemen. So there's a real risk to American interests in the Saudis taking over this American institution. We want to get to the bottom of it. Well, how deep are you willing to dig? You've asked for records from the executives. Do you want records from the players? We welcome player cooperation. We have reason to believe that players are dissatisfied with this result. Many of them feel betrayed, as do the 9-11 families. And so we're seeking records and documents right now. I'm not going to prejudge where we're going. Uh, is a subpoena on the table, Senator Blumenthal? Is a subpoena on the table if you don't get what you want? Any of the tools at our disposal, including subpoenas and hearings, recommendations for action and legislation, are all on the table. We are ready and willing to seek information by whatever legal means we have to obtain it. How soon could a hearing be held on Capitol Hill? I think a hearing is possible within weeks. The American people deserve a clear look at the facts here. Again, not prejudging what the conclusions will be. But uh, what the Saudis are doing here is not taking control of a single team or hiring one player. They are, in effect, taking charge of the entire sport. Is that and a national security concern, it Senator? It is the regime. I think there are national security implications to this deal. Anytime there is foreign influence by a repressive regime over a central American institution, there is a security risk. And remember, this institution plays a central role in our society and culture. The players are ambassadors and role models, and there are economic implications. The Travelers Tournament, beginning this week, is going to have an economic impact on local economies here in Connecticut in the tens of millions of dollars. So there are clearly risks to American security in a repressive regime having this kind of influence over a central, iconic, cherished institution. When you say this kind of influence, the counter has always been the claim that it's a minority stake by the Saudis. What's your response to that? 
we still have yet to hear authoritatively what the terms of the deal are, but reportedly the chairmanship is going to go to the head of the Saudi Public Investment Fund, the PIF, uh, Yasser al Ramayan, who is a close confidant of the ruling monarchy. And so we have every reason to believe that the Saudis are taking control. And the 9-11 families feel betrayed, so do the players. And I sat with the leadership of the PGA Tour just about a year ago in Cromwell. They sought to enlist me and my colleagues in supporting their efforts to bring back players from LIV. There is an ongoing antitrust investigation reportedly by the Justice Department. A lot is going on here, and it should be. A lot more to hear from you in the coming weeks. Senator Blumenthal, thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate it. And the PGA Tour declined our invitation for Commissioner Jay Monahan to appear on the broadcast as he's on medical leave. But they said in a statement they are, quote, confident that once all stakeholders learn more, they will understand how it benefits our players, fans, and sport. We'll be back in a moment. We mentioned that tumultuous week at the top of the show, so who better to turn to than our CBS News political panel with us this morning? Political correspondent Caitlin Huey Burns, congressional correspondent Nicole Killian, and senior investigative correspondent Catherine Harris. Thank you all for being here this morning. Terrific to have you here with me at the table. Catherine, let's begin with you. Can you react to former Attorney General Bill Barr and his statement that he believes Trump could be indicted on the January 6th investigation? Well, I took notes during your interview, and what jumped out to me was his statement that this was not government overreach in the Florida indictment, that this was self-inflicted, uh, fundamentally flawed, he said of the former president, and that it was reckless conduct. And the reason Bill Barr's comments matter and may even sting for some is that he's been attorney general twice. And when he served then-President Trump, he was a staunch defender during the Russia collusion allegations. And what we know now from the special counsel's findings, John Durham, is that the FBI, when there was evidence that conflicted with that narrative, they discounted it or they willfully ignored it. And as we know, that's completely inconsistent with the FBI's assessment as being the preeminent law enforcement agency. Nicole, you listened to former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie as the whole Republican presidential race heats up and Trump's conduct's in the spotlight. But you're on Capitol Hill day in, day out, talking to congressional Republicans there, often to Speaker McCarthy. How is the response to the indictment just days ago in the arraignment unfolding on your beat? Yeah, I think what struck me about what the governor said is multiple times he described this indictment as disturbing and then ultimately said that he believes that the former president's conduct was indefensible. Yet on Capitol Hill, you pretty much have just the opposite with congressional Republicans largely rallying and defending uh, the former president. I mean, take, for instance, I asked Speaker McCarthy just last week, was it a good look to have these boxes stacked in a bathroom at Mar-a-Lago? And his response to me was a bathroom door lock. So, I mean, that is the defense that some Republicans are putting forth. That being said, I do think you are starting to see some daylight between Republicans, even among House Republicans. For instance, Ken Buck just recently said that if the former president is convicted, he cannot support him in 2024. You look over at the Senate side, people like John Thune, one of the top Republicans in the Senate, uh, saying that, you know, look, we've lost in 18, we've lost in 20, we've lost in 22. This is really not a winning strategy to stick with a guy like the former president. To take what Nicole just said, Caitlin, she used the phrase daylight. Is there daylight emerging in the presidential race? You've been talking to Senator Tim Scott, covering former Ambassador Nikki Haley and so many others. How is this going to affect the Republican presidential race beyond Governor Christie? You know, what I think is so remarkable is if you take a step back, you had this week the Republican frontrunner for the presidential nomination indicted, charged with mishandling national security by the federal government. You would think that would be a huge opening for Republicans who are vying to go uh, have that position um, to go after him. And yet, we haven't seen a real co cohesive strategy on behalf of Republicans to take down Donald Trump. You've seen a lot of Republicans get into the race. The virtue of their candidacies is that they do sense that there is an opening, a vulnerability with Trump. But they are 
you know, loathe to cross him and especially his supporters. So you saw this week, as you said, um, maligning the Justice Department, going a little bit farther. Nikki Haley, Tim Scott, Mike Pence went a little bit farther than they have been to condemn what the allegations suggest. But they're looking at the numbers here. And our CBS polling showed that 76 percent of Republican primary voters think that this are more concerned that this was um, a political indictment. So the question moving forward is that the the course of this primary is really going to be defined by Trump's legal troubles. We have, as you were talking to Bill Barr about, um, the January 6th investigation, the investigation in Georgia. As this unfolds, does this boost him, or does do the candidates look at this and say, time to go after him? They haven't reached that conclusion yet. Speaking about a question moving forward, Catherine, who's going to represent the former president? So much chaos inside of his legal team. Well, they haven't ruled out adding even more lawyers, especially down in Florida, as they address this indictment in that state. What I learned in my conversations over the weekend with sources close to his legal team is that as a threshold issue, they're likely anticipating some limited discovery to kind of get under the hood of the special counsel's case and the strength of the evidence. And then the other two top tier targets are a motion to dismiss based on allegations of prosecutorial misconduct. You're familiar with that through your own reporting. And then the second is to get excluded these notes from Evan Corcoran, the former defense attorney, which are at the heart of this obstruction case. And the thing that I learned this weekend, which was new to me, is that these notes are more than 40 pages in length. So I think it is fair to say in this indictment, we're seeing a snapshot of those conversations and not quite the full picture. Something we don't have a snapshot of yet is Georgia. Uh, former Attorney General Barr, Nicole, he seemed to wave it off a little bit, but you've been covering this for months, and we've heard that Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis has a charging decision that's going to be announced sometime maybe late July, maybe early August. Take us inside the latest on Georgia. Well, I think Fulton County definitely is preparing. And, you know, we saw that in a number of ways by Fonnie Willis coming out in two letters stating that she intends to announce these charging decisions at some point this summer between July 18th, September 1st, even narrowing that time frame perhaps into uh, early August. But uh, this is a multifaceted investigation. Obviously, at the heart of it is an investigation into election interference in the 2020 election in the state of Georgia. It also deals with the issue of a false slate of electors, which we learned recently, uh, some of them accepted uh, an immunity deal. And it also dives into potential data breaches uh, that existed in other counties in Georgia. So this is a very sprawling case. Uh, what we do know, though, is that, uh, you know, the special grand jury completed its report earlier this year. Uh, what they found was no widespread evidence of fraud, but they do believe that some of the individuals may have committed perjury. We also know that some of the jurors have since spoken out since this report has wrapped up, suggesting that indictments are possible. So uh, that is why I think you see the uh, district attorney trying to lay that groundwork uh, for when she makes that decision. Georgia officials tell me when and if the time comes, they believe they're ready. So, um, I appreciate that update because it's sometimes hard to keep track. There's the New York <laughs> investigation. There's two special counsels, January 6th in records, and then, of course, what's going on in Georgia. But as much as it seems to dominate the news, Trump and his legal challenges, that's not the only story right now in American politics. It's just a year ago. Roe v. Wade was overturned last summer. And when you listen to President Biden on the campaign trail this weekend, or you hear from Vice President Kamala Harris, you're hearing about abortion rights. And so despite all the Trump frenzy, Abortion rights, it does still seem to be front and center. What's your reporting on that? And they are deploying Kamala Harris to go to North Carolina later this week uh, to mark the anniversary. North Carolina, of course, just passed an abortion law uh, recently. Democrats certainly believe that this is an animating force, and they've seen that proven in Democratic politics. But what's interesting is that now that we're a year removed from the court decision, it kicked everything back to the states. The states decided their own laws. And now the real battle is in the state Supreme Courts. And that's what we saw in Iowa this week. Um, 
we are expecting a decision in South Carolina and in Florida. Um, and so that's the real front here in this next phase, and also why a lot of activists are looking at constitutional ballot measures in states. I just got back from Ohio doing some reporting on that as well. And what I think also, as you're looking at the primary landscape and Republican Party politics, we have seen them kind of struggle to define positions. But what's interesting now is that you're seeing Ron DeSantis really take an opportunity to go after Donald Trump from the right. Um, so as much as we're talking about the investigations and whether Republicans want to talk about them, DeSantis is figuring this is an issue where he can uh, boast a more conservative agenda than the former president. Nicole, I just want to bounce off that with you. When you're on Capitol Hill and talking to congressional Republicans, someone like former Governor Christie often says, oh, a national abortion ban is never going to happen. There needs to be a consensus in the states first. But do you believe if the Freedom Caucus types in the House get more power, and maybe their allies in the Senate get more power, that they would pursue a national abortion ban if it was a Republican-controlled Congress across the board? I think it's possible, but I also think that the approach has been pretty fractured in Congress, where you have, you know, some are pushing for a six-week ban, some support a 15-week ban. Uh, and Honestly, you know, since the Roe v. Wade decision was overturned, while there was a lot of hype at the beginning, is there going to be some type of national ban? We've really seen Republicans kind of push back off of that. If anything, it's Democrats that are really trying to keep this front and center. And next week, we know that House Democrats will be introducing a discharge petition to try to restore abortion access, even if it's just a symbolic move. A lot to follow across all of the beats. Couldn't be luckier than to have all of you here to open your notebooks. Really appreciate you stopping by on a Sunday. We'll be right back. That's it for us today. Thanks for watching. And we want to wish all you fathers out there, including my own dad, a very happy Father's Day. Margaret will be back next week. For Face the Nation, I'm Robert Costa.